Hi, today I'm reading out of a hard copy version of The Copper Revolution and uh, reading chapter 24. Uh, 45 copper antagonists, some are also synergists. I've decided to order the list in some kind of order. It could have been alphabetical, but that's typically useless. It could have been by categories, such as minerals and vitamins. I decided to order the list from my favorite items to my least favorite items. So starting with iodine. Iodine may block copper through increased sweating. And up to one milligrams of copper can be lost in sweat in a day. Uh, furthermore, I've uh, remembered that uh, sometimes people on the high iodine protocol end up with vitiligo, which is loss of pigment in the skin, which can be from uh, copper depletion. Uh, and zinc. Zinc blocks copper when zinc is taken above 50 milligrams, or even as low as 30 milligrams, uh, but it usually blocks copper at up to 100 milligrams. Uh, even somebody taking 100 milligrams of zinc and only 2 milligrams of copper has developed copper deficiency. Uh, vitamin C. Vitamin C blocks copper through lowering cerebroplasmin at uh, 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C, but that's in people who don't supplement copper. Uh, greens. Leafy green vegetables are uh, chelators and diuretics and absorb all minerals. Uh, boron. Boron supplementation causes more copper to come out in the urine. Uh, boron is also, though, a copper... Uh, booster because uh, boron can increase cereloplasmin, which is a copper transport protein. Uh, fiber. Fiber like greens, fiber may absorb copper. Selenium minerals are often antagonistic to copper. I don't know if selenium is a very strong copper antagonist because the amount of selenium that people get is very low and even the supplemental amounts are very small. Uh, but DMSO, MSM sulfur. Sulfur is known to bind to copper, such as, uh, of course, in the form of copper sulfate. Uh, silica can block copper. Silver. Silver is said to displace copper, yet silver is not involved in making enzymes, but silver, like copper, does kill pathogens. Molybdenum usually blocks copper. Uh, uh, usually copper blocks molybdenum because most people get more copper than molybdenum, but high molybdenum soils have been known to block copper in animals by way of increasing copper excretion. Uh, calcium. And this is a big curve. See, low calcium seems to hinder copper's absorption but some calcium helps copper's absorption, and then, again, too much calcium can block copper again. Uh, potassium. Potassium also helps absorb copper, but at perhaps high levels, it blocks copper. Phosphorus can block copper. Exercise can block copper. Sweating heavily. Again, up to one milligram of copper can be lost in sweat, which is uh, if, if people are sweating more than the average, and, and that's more than the average copper a person gets in a day. Uh, drinking distilled water. Distilled water has distilled water has no minerals and uh, acts as a mild diuretic. Sunlight. Uh, copper may be used up in the process of converting dopamine to melanin, which is the color showing in a tan and also responsible for hair color. Curcumin, turmeric, can block copper. Niacin, vitamin B3, can block copper. Niacin binds to and can block copper, especially if taken to excess. Uh, copper might also block niacin. Uh, if you look at niacin toxicity, a lot of the symptoms uh, for niacin toxicity look a lot like copper deficiency. Uh, watermelon and glutathione can block copper. Coffee. Coffee is a diuretic, meaning it depletes minerals. Sugar. Sugar contains no minerals, and fructose itself blocks copper. Um, phytate. In many carbohydrates, phytates absorb copper in the gut, preventing you from absorbing it. And excess dietary cholesterol can block copper. Uh, stress. I try to avoid uh, things here and this below on the list. These are now, uh, you know, stress can release this cortisol and adrenaline, which can use up copper. Iron competitively blocks copper's absorption. Vitamin D supplements blocks copper because vitamin D lowers vitamin A, which is needed for cereloplasmin, which is a copper transport enzyme. Uh, alcohol can block copper. Mints can block copper. Aspartame can block copper. Painkillers. Mints and painkillers both block copper. Uh, prescription drugs and street drugs can block copper. There's a class of prescription drugs that I forgot to include in this book, but I wanted to include both chelators and diuretics can specifically block copper. Also, fluoride-based medicines, which I go over, can block copper. Antacids, I learned, can block copper. Tin, block copper. Cadmium can block copper. Lead, bromine, fluoride, and other toxins and parasites. Uh, given that there are so many copper antagonists that lower or block copper, this would make it nearly impossible to study, quote, what diets of X milligrams of copper actually does. Because of so many potential confounding factors, all those other things, 
we could naturally expect to see a wide variety of potential outcomes. Naturally, the more copper blockers one is, takes or is influenced by, such as lead contamination, the more copper one would need. At one point, I was doing or taking 19 other copper antagonists simultaneously. And in the past, I had been doing several others as well. So it's no wonder that I personally became copper deficient and benefited from taking so much copper. That could, of course, possibly contribute to my bias in favor of copper. Another factor to consider is that people who take many of the other good minerals and vitamins on the list uh, that can block copper might not only need more copper, but might also tolerate far higher levels of copper far better than other people who weren't taking so many other minerals or vitamins or other copper blockers. Some people mistakenly use zinc and vitamin C to, quote, lower toxic copper. Others like myself take zinc and vitamin C because they're good in their own right, and I take extra copper to balance out their anti-copper effects. And another way to look at it, someone who only took copper as a supplement and no other supplements might need to take far less copper if they're not taking any of the other copper blocking supplements. I apologize for the lack of proof or source for each of and every one of these things on my list, sometimes I'm better at making lists than keeping track of my sources. In this case, I've been building this list of copper blockers for nearly four years. I've only intended to write this book for the last year. So again, apologize for the lack of sources on everything, but I've done pretty good. So now here is, let's review some of the evidence for the copper antagonists, iodine. I don't have strong proof that iodine blocks copper, but iodine can increase sweating and copper is lost in the sweat. Iodine and copper combine together, and both are easily excreted in the urine. Uh, some people on the high iodine protocols appear to end up with adrenal fatigue, and copper gives us energy, and copper fixed my adrenal fatigue that developed a few months after I started on iodine. I don't find it unusual that there was so little research in this particular area. The reason is that the high iodine movement is a very small minority of doctors and a very small community, and none of the iodine doctors that I know of advocate copper, so maybe they just don't know about it. And that's typical and that's that's fine that's normal uh, zinc here's a link that shows that one woman taking 121 milligrams of zinc with only two milligrams of copper for five years caused a copper deficiency yet some zinc at reasonable levels increases copper absorption as follows turnland et al in 1988 found that diets low in zinc below the dietary requirement decreased copper absorption in humans 48.1% of radio-labeled copper was absorbed when the diet contained only 1.3 milligrams of copper and 16.5 milligrams of zinc. A dietary requirement is 15 milligrams. Uh, and 37% uh, of radio-labeled copper was absorbed, or 37 to 38% of radio-labeled copper was absorbed when the diet contained 1.3 milligrams of copper, which is the same amount, and only 5 milligrams of zinc. So the absorption of copper went from 48% down to 38%, when the zinc went from 16 to five milligrams. So there's a curve for absorbing copper with zinc. At low levels of zinc, 5.5 milligrams, copper is less well absorbed, 37%, at 1.3 milligrams of copper. At moderate levels of zinc, say 16.5 milligrams of zinc, copper is better absorbed, which is 48% of 1.3 milligrams of copper. And at high levels of zinc, at 121 milligrams, even two milligrams of copper leads to copper deficiency. So other data points in these studies appear to be speaking of people taking only zinc and no copper. Another study, excessive intakes and toxicity, uh, acute toxicity resulting in gastrointestinal irritation and vomiting has been observed following the ingestion of two grams, 2000 milligrams or more of zinc in the form of sulfate. The more subtle effects of moderately elevated intakes not uncommon in the US population are of greater concern because they are not easily detected. Impairment of the copper status of volunteers by dietary zinc intakes of 18.5 milligrams or 25 milligrams a day has been reported. Look at that, impairment of copper status at 18.5 milligrams. That's so close to the 16.5 milligrams where they said was uh, slightly increased absorption. So that's very interesting. Patients given zinc in quantities of 10 to 30 times the RDA for several months develop hypocupremia, which is a low copper, mitocytosis, and neutropenia. Neutropenia is low white blood cells, which is copper deficiency. Zinc supplementation of healthy adults with amounts of 20 times the RDA for six weeks resulted in the impairment of various immune responses. Again, copper deficiency. 
Daily supplementations of 80 to 150 milligrams caused a decline of high-density lipoproteins in serum after several weeks. For these reasons, chronic ingestion of zinc supplements exceeding 15 milligrams a day is not recommended without adequate medical supervision. I don't agree with that last part. I think anybody can take any vitamin and mineral they want to. We have uh, freedom of speech and we have uh, freedom to um, take any supplement we want in this country. And I think if we take a little bit more copper, we can not only tolerate more zinc, but we probably also need more zinc. Vitamin C, at 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C, it lowers cerebral plasmin. On the other hand, whole food vitamin C contains copper in the center, probably not very much, and they're both needed to make collagen. Both appear necessary to stop bleeding. Boron, use of antagonistic metals to correct copper metabolism in patients with heptocerebral dystrophy. There's a link, and here's a quote. An inversely proportional relationship between the content of boron and copper in patients' urine was discovered. The fact that points to their competition. It is recommended to use boron compounds for removing copper from the body if this metal is accumulated in pathological quantities. Of note, very few people supplement with boron. I do. Why? I take boron because boron helps us retain calcium and magnesium, helps cure arthritis, and helps detox fluoride. And I have an article on boron and a link. So, my boron plus the high iodine protocol plus my weightlifting could explain why I slipped back into copper deficiency so quickly when I stopped taking copper and could explain my bias in favor of copper. Let's either blame or cheer for the boron iodine and lifting for my discoveries of copper. Copper absorption can be inhibited by phytate, zinc, iron, molybdenum, calcium, and phosphorus. So molybdenum can block copper, but this but usually this effect, again, is noted at extremely high molybdenum levels in animals or when a molybdenum-containing drug is used to detox copper, such as in Wilson's disease. Since molybdenum supplements come in, come in low levels, this potential danger is minimal and rare. Copper deficiency exasperates bile duct uh, ligation-induced liver injury and fibrosis in rats. In the study above, they induced or created copper deficiency in rats by giving them a drug, tetrathiomolybdate, at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram by body weight. 10 milligrams per kilogram for a man of 100 kilos would be 1,000 milligrams of molybdenum-containing drug. Uh, people normally get about a half uh, of one milligram of molybdenum in the diet or less, or about uh, 0 0.3 milligrams of molybdenum in mostly found in a serving of one cup of beans. So again, molybdenum blocking copper is not usually uh, a valid concern unless you're on that particular drug. Phytate, phytate blocks copper. So phytic acid foods consist of grains such as whole wheat, oats, and rice. Legumes such as black beans, pinto beans, kidney beans, soybeans, peanuts, and lentils. Nuts and seeds such as walnuts, pine nuts, almonds, and sesame seeds, and tubers such as potatoes, turnips, beets, and carrots. Copper and Health from Wikipedia says, elevated levels of dietary zinc as well as cadmium, high intakes of phytate and simple sugars, fructose and sucrose inhibit dietary absorption of copper. So I note sugar leads to lower copper and causes diabetes. Diabetes, of course, as we found in the book, is a copper deficiency disease. Copper absorption and bioavailability, study and link. Copper status in humans can deteriorate and the predominant carbohydrate in the diet is fructose. The extensive use of fructose-containing sweeteners in convenience foods and beverages has made this finding relevant. People eat way too much sugar. That explains why so many people are copper deficient. I will continue in a minute, but I'm going to pause for here.